Disc 2 Satisfied with what he had achieved, Poirot took his leave of his friend. The information he wanted would be forthcoming, he had no doubt as to that. He had got Spence interested. And Spence, once set upon a trail, was not one to relinquish it. His reputation as a retired high-ranking officer of the CID would have won him friends in the local police departments concerned. And next? Poirot consulted his watch. He was to meet Mrs. Oliver in exactly ten minutes' time outside a house called Apple Trees. Really, the name seemed uncannily appropriate. Really, thought Poirot, one didn't seem able to get away from apples. Nothing could be more agreeable than a juicy English apple, and yet here were apples mixed up with broomsticks and witches and old-fashioned folklore and a murdered child. Following the route indicated to him, Poirot arrived to the minute outside a red-brick Georgian-style house with a neat beech hedge enclosing it and a pleasant garden showing beyond. He put his hand out, raised the latch, and entered through the wrought-iron gate which bore a painted board labelled apple trees. A path led up to the front door, looking rather like one of those Swiss clocks where figures come out automatically of a door above the clock face, the front door opened and Mrs. Oliver emerged on the steps. "'You're absolutely punctual,' she said breathlessly. "'I was watching for you from the window.' Poirot turned and closed the gate carefully behind him. Practically on every occasion that he had met Mrs. Oliver, whether by appointment or by accident, a motif of apples seemed to be introduced almost immediately. She was either eating an apple, or had been eating an apple, witness an apple core nestling on her broad chest, or was carrying a bag of apples. But today there was no apple in evidence at all. Very correct, Poirot thought approvingly. It would have been in very bad taste to be gnawing an apple here, on the scene of what had been not only a crime, but a tragedy. For what else can it be but that, thought Poirot, the sudden death of a child of only thirteen years old? He did not like to think of it, and because he did not like to think of it, he was all the more decided in his mind that that was exactly what he was going to think of, until by some means or other light should shine out of the darkness, and he should see clearly what he had come here to see. "'I can't think why you wouldn't come and stay with Judith Butler,' said Mrs. Oliver, instead of going to a fifth-class guest-house. "'Because it is better that I should survey things with a certain degree of aloofness,' said Poirot. "'One must not get involved, you comprehend.' "'I don't see how you can avoid getting involved,' said Mrs. Oliver. "'You've got to see everyone, and talk to them, haven't you?' "'That most decidedly,' said Poirot. "'Who have you seen so far?' "'My friend, Superintendent Spence.' "'What's he like nowadays?' said Mrs. Oliver. "'A good deal older than he was,' said Poirot. "'Naturally,' said Mrs. Oliver. "'What else would you expect? "'Is he deafer or blinder or fatter or thinner?' Poirot considered. "'He has lost a little weight. Uh, "'He wears spectacles for reading the paper. "'I do not think he is deaf, not to any noticeable extent. "'And what does he think about it all?' "'You go too quickly,' said Poirot. "'And what exactly are you and he going to do?' "'I have planned my programme," said Poirot. First, I have seen and consulted with my old friend. "'I asked him to get me perhaps some information "'that would not be easy to get otherwise.' Oh, you mean the police here will be his buddies, and he'll get a lot of inside stuff from them? Well, I should not put it exactly like that, but, uh, yes, those are the lines along which I have been thinking. And after that? I come to meet you here, madame. I have to see just where this thing happened. Mrs. Oliver turned her head and looked up at the house. It doesn't look the sort of house there'd be a murder in, does it? she said. Poirot thought again. What an unerring instinct she has. No, he said. It does not look at all that sort of a house. After I have seen where, then I go with you to see the mother of the dead child. I hear what she can tell me. This afternoon my friend Spence is making an appointment for me to talk with the local inspector at a suitable hour. I should also like a talk with the doctor here, and possibly the headmistress at the school. At six o'clock I drink tea and eat sausages with my friend Spence and his sister again in their house and we discuss. Uh, what more do you think he'll be able to tell you? I want to meet his sister. She has lived here longer than he has. He came here to join her when her husband died. She will know, perhaps, the people here fairly well.
Do you know what you sound like? said Mrs. Oliver. A computer. You know, you're programming yourself. That's what they call it, isn't it? I mean, you're feeding all these things into yourself all day, and then you're going to see what comes out. It is certainly an idea you have there, said Poirot, with some interest. Yes, yes, I play the part of the computer. One feeds in the information, and supposing you come up with all the wrong answers, said Mrs. Oliver. That would be impossible, said Hercule Poirot. Computers do not do that sort of a thing. Well, they're supposed not to, said Mrs. Oliver, but you'd be surprised at the things that happen sometimes. My last electric light bill, for instance. I know there's a proverb which says to err is human, but a human error is nothing to what a computer can do if it tries. Come on in and meet Mrs. Drake. Mrs. Drake was certainly something, Poirot thought. She was a tall, handsome woman of forty-odd. Her golden hair was lightly tinged with grey. Her eyes were brilliantly blue. She oozed competence from the fingertips downwards. Any party she had arranged would have been a successful one. In the drawing-room, a tray of morning coffee with two sugared biscuits was awaiting them. Apple trees, he saw, was a most admirably kept house. It was well furnished, it had carpets of excellent quality, everything was scrupulously polished and cleaned, and the fact that it had hardly any outstanding object of interest in it was not readily noticeable. One would not have expected it. The colours of the curtains and the covers were pleasant but conventional. It could have been let furnished at any moment for a high rent to a desirable tenant without having to put away any treasures or make any alterations to the arrangement of the furniture. Mrs. Drake greeted Mrs. Oliver and Poirot, and concealed almost entirely what Poirot could not help suspecting was a feeling of vigorously suppressed annoyance at the position in which she found herself as the hostess at a social occasion at which something as antisocial as murder had occurred. As a prominent member of the community of Woodley Common, he suspected that she felt an unhappy sense of having herself in some way proved inadequate. What had occurred should not have occurred. To someone else, in someone else's house, yes, but at a party for children, arranged by her, given by her, organized by her, nothing like this ought to have happened. Somehow or other, she ought to have seen to it that it did not happen. And Poirot also had a suspicion that she was seeking round irritably in the back of her mind for a reason. Not so much a reason for murder having taken place, but to find out and pin down some inadequacy on the part of someone who had been helping her, and who had by some mismanagement or some lack of perception failed to realize that something like this could happen. Monsieur Poirot, said Mrs. Drake, in her fine speaking voice, which Poirot thought would come over excellently in a small lecture room or the village hall, I am so pleased you could come down here. Mrs. Oliver has been telling me how invaluable your help will be to us in this terrible crisis. Rest assured, madame, I shall do what I can. But as you no doubt realize from your experience of life, it is going to be a difficult business. Difficult? said Mrs. Drake. Of course it's going to be difficult. It seems incredible, absolutely incredible, that such an awful thing should have happened. I suppose, she added, the police may know something? Inspector Raglan has a very good reputation locally, I believe. Whether or not they ought to call Scotland Yard in, I don't know. The idea seems to be that this poor child's death must have had a local significance. I needn't tell you, Monsieur Poirot, after all, you read the papers as much as I do, that there have been very many sad fatalities with children all over the countryside. They seem to be getting more and more frequent. Mental instability seems to be on the increase, though I must say that mothers and families generally are not looking after children properly, as they used to do. Children are sent home from school alone on dark evenings, go alone on dark early mornings, and children, however much you warn them, are unfortunately very foolish when it comes to being offered a lift in a smart-looking car. They believe what they're told. I suppose one cannot help that? But what happened here, madame, was of an entirely different nature. Oh, I know. I know. That's why I used the term incredible. I still cannot quite believe it, said Mrs. Drake. Everything was entirely under control. All the arrangements were made. Everything was going perfectly, all according to plan. It just seems, seems incredible. Personally, I consider myself there must be what I call an outside significance to this. Someone walked into the house, 
not a difficult thing to do under the circumstances. Someone of highly disturbed mentality, I suppose, the kind of people who are let out of mental homes simply because there is no room for them there, as far as I can see. Nowadays, room has to be made for fresh patients all the time. Anyone peeping in through a window could see a children's party was going on, and this poor wretch, if one can really feel pity for these people, which I really must say I find it very hard to do myself sometimes, enticed this child away somehow and killed her. You can't think such a thing could happen, but it did happen. Perhaps you would show me where. Of course. No more coffee? I thank you, no. Mrs. Drake got up. The police seemed to think it took place while the snapdragon was going on. That was taking place in the dining room. She walked across the hall, opened the door, and rather in the manner of someone doing the honours at a stately home for a party of charabangos, indicated the large dining table and the heavy velvet curtains. It was dark here, of course, except for the blazing dish, and now— She led them across the hall and opened the door of a small room with armchairs, sporting prints and bookshelves. The library, said Mrs. Drake, and shivered a little. The bucket was here, on a plastic sheet, of course. Mrs. Oliver had not accompanied them into the room. She was standing outside in the hall. I can't come in, she said to Poirot. It makes me think of it too much. Oh, there's nothing to see now, said Mrs. Drake. I mean, I'm just showing you where, as you asked. I suppose, said Poirot, there was water, a good deal of water. There was water in the bucket, of course, said Mrs. Drake. She looked at Poirot as though she thought he was not quite all there. And there was water on the sheet. I mean, if the child's head was pushed under water, there would be a lot of water splashed about. Oh, yes. Even while the bobbing was going on, the bucket had to be filled up once or twice. So the person who did it, that person also would have got wet, one would think. Yes. Yes, I suppose so. That was not specially noticed. No. No, the inspector asked me about that. You see, by the end of the evening, nearly everyone was a bit disheveled or damp or flowery. There doesn't seem to be any useful clues there at all. I mean, the police didn't think so. No, said Poirot. I suppose the only clue was the child herself. I hope you will tell me all you know about her. About Joyce? Mrs. Drake looked slightly taken aback. It was as though Joyce, in her mind, had by now retreated so far out of things that she was quite surprised to be reminded of her. The victim is always important, said Poirot. The victim, you see, is so often the cause of the crime. Well, I suppose— Yes, I see what you mean, said Mrs. Drake, who quite plainly did not. Shall we come back to the drawing-room? And then you will tell me about Joyce, said Poirot. They settled themselves once more in the drawing-room. Mrs. Drake was looking uncomfortable. "'I don't know, really, what you expect me to say, Monsieur Poirot,' she said. "'Surely all information can be obtained quite easily from the police or from Joyce's mother. Poor woman! It will be painful for her, no doubt, but—' "'But what I want,' said Poirot, "'is not a mother's estimate of a dead daughter. It is a clear, unbiased opinion from someone who has a good knowledge of human nature.' I should say, madame, that you yourself have been an active worker in many welfare and social fields here. Nobody, I am sure, could sum up more aptly the character and disposition of someone whom you know. Well, it is a little difficult. I mean, children of that age. She was thirteen, I think, twelve or thirteen, are very much alike at a certain age. Ah, no, surely not, said Poirot. There are very great differences in character, in disposition— "'Did you like her?' Mrs. Drake seemed to find the question embarrassing. "'Well, of course, I I liked her. Uh, I mean, well, I, I like all children. Most people do.' "'Ah, there I do not agree with you,' said Poirot. "'Some children I consider are most unattractive. "'Well, I, I agree they're not brought up very well nowadays. "'Everything seems left to the school, and, of course, they lead very permissive lives, "'have their own choice of friends, and, uh, Really, Monsieur Poirot, was she a nice child, or not a nice child? said Poirot insistently. Mrs. Drake looked at him, and registered censure.
You must realize, Monsieur Poirot, that the poor child is dead. Dead or alive, it matters. Perhaps if she was a nice child, nobody would have wanted to kill her. But if she was not a nice child, somebody might have wanted to kill her, and did so. Well, I, I suppose... Surely it isn't a question of niceness, is it? It could be. I also understand that she claimed to have seen a murder committed. Oh, that, said Mrs. Drake contemptuously. You did not take that statement seriously. Well, of course I didn't. It was a very silly thing to say. How did she come to say it? Well, I think really they were all rather excited about Mrs. Oliver being here. You are a very famous person, you must remember, dear, said Mrs. Drake, addressing Mrs. Oliver. The word dear seemed included in her speech without any accompanying enthusiasm. I don't suppose the subject would ever have arisen otherwise, but the children were excited by meeting a famous authoress. So Joyce said that she had seen a murder committed, said Poirot thoughtfully. Yes, she said something of the kind. I wasn't really listening. But you do remember that she said it? Oh, yes, she said it. But I didn't believe it, said Mrs. Drake. Her sister hushed her up at once very properly. And she was annoyed about that, was she? Yes, she went on saying that it was true. In fact, she boasted about it. W when you put it that way, yes. It might have been true, I suppose, said Poirot. Nonsense. I don't believe it for one minute, said Mrs. Drake. It's the sort of stupid thing Joyce would say. She was a stupid girl? Well, she was the kind, I think, who liked to show off, said Mrs. Drake. You know, she always wanted to have seen more or done more than other girls. Not a very lovable character, said Poirot. No, indeed, said Mrs. Drake. Really the kind that you have to be shutting up all the time. What did the other children who were here have to say about it? Were they impressed? Well, they laughed at her, said Mrs. Drake. So, of course, that made her worse. Well, said Poirot as he rose, I am glad to have your positive assurance on that point. He bowed politely over her hand. Goodbye, madame. Thank you so much for allowing me to view the scene of this very unpleasant occurrence. I hope it has not recalled unpleasant memories too definitely to you. Well, of course, said Mrs. Drake. It is very painful to recall anything of this kind. I had so hoped our little party would go off well. Indeed, it was going off well, and everyone seemed to be enjoying it so much till this terrible thing happened. However, the only thing one can do is to try and forget it all. Of course, it's very unfortunate that Joyce should have made this silly remark about seeing a murder. Have you ever had a murder in Woodley Common? Not that I can remember, said Mrs. Drake firmly. In this age of increased crime that we live in, said Poirot, that really seems somewhat unusual, does it not? Well, I think there was a lorry driver who killed a pal of his, or something like that, and a little girl whom they found buried in a gravel pit about fifteen miles from here, but that was years ago. They were both rather sordid and uninteresting crimes, mainly the result of drink, I think. In fact, the kind of murder unlikely to have been witnessed by a girl of twelve or thirteen. A most unlikely, I should say. And I can assure you, Monsieur Poirot, this statement that the girl made was solely in order to impress friends and perhaps interest a famous character. She looked rather coldly across at Mrs. Oliver. In fact, said Mrs. Oliver, it's all my fault for being at the party, I suppose. Oh, of course not, my dear. Of course I didn't mean it that way. Poirot sighed as he departed from the house with Mrs. Oliver by his side. A very unsuitable place for a murder, he said, as they walked down the path to the gate. No atmosphere, no haunting sense of tragedy, no character worth murdering. Though I cannot help thinking that just occasionally someone might feel like murdering Mrs. Drake. I know what you mean. She can be intensely irritating sometimes, so pleased with herself and so complacent. What is her husband like? Oh, she's a widow. Her husband died a year or two ago. He got polio and had been a cripple for years. He was a banker originally, I think. He was very keen on games and sport, and hated having to give all that up and to be an invalid. Yes, indeed. He reverted to the subject of the child Joyce. Just tell me this. Did anyone who was listening take this assertion of the child Joyce about murder seriously? I don't know. I shouldn't have thought anyone did. The other children, for instance? Well, I was thinking really of them.
No, I, I don't think they believed what Joyce was saying. They thought she was making things up. Did you think that too? Well, I did, really, said Mrs. Oliver. Of course, she added, Mrs. Drake would like to believe that the murder never really happened. But she can't very well go as far as that, can she? I understand that this may be painful for her. I suppose it is, in a way, said Mrs. Oliver, but I think that by now, you know, she's actually getting quite pleased to talk about it. I don't think she likes to have to bottle it up all the time. Do you like her? asked Poirot. Do you think she's a nice woman? You do ask the most difficult questions. Embarrassing ones, said Mrs. Oliver. It seems the only thing you are interested in is whether people are nice or not. Rowena Drake is the bossy type, likes running things and people. She runs this whole place, more or less, I should think but runs it very efficiently. It depends if you like bossy women. I don't much. What about Joyce's mother, whom we are on our way to see? Oh, she's quite a nice woman. Rather stupid, I should think. I'm sorry for her. It's pretty awful to have your daughter murdered, isn't it? And everyone here thinks it was a sex crime, which makes it worse. But there was no evidence of sexual assault, or so I understand. Oh, no, but people like to think these things happen. It makes it more exciting. You know what people are like. One thinks one does, but sometimes, well, we do not really know at all. Wouldn't it be better if my friend Judith Butler was to take you to see Mrs. Reynolds? She knows her quite well, and I'm a stranger to her. We will do as planned. The computer program will go on, murmured Mrs. Oliver rebelliously. Mrs. Reynolds was a complete contrast to Mrs. Drake. There was no air of poised competence about her, nor indeed was there ever likely to be. She was wearing conventional black, and had a moist handkerchief clasped in her hand, and was clearly prepared to dissolve into tears at any moment. "'It's very kind of you, I'm sure,' she said to Mrs. Oliver, "'to bring a friend of yours down here to help us.' She put a damp hand into Poirot's and looked at him doubtfully. And if he can help in any way, I'm sure I'll be very grateful, though I don't see what anyone can do. Nothing will bring her back, poor child. It's awful to think of, how anyone could deliberately kill anyone of that age. If she had only cried out, though I suppose he rammed her head under the water straight away and held it there. Oh, I can't bear to think of it, I really can't. Indeed, madame, I do not want to distress you. Please do not think of it. I only want to ask you a few questions that might help. Help, that is, to find your daughter's murderer. You've no idea yourself, I suppose, who it can possibly be. How could I have any idea? I shouldn't have thought there was anyone, anyone living here, I mean. This is such a nice place, and the people living here are such nice people. I suppose it was just someone... Some awful man who came in through one of the windows. Perhaps he'd taken drugs or something. He saw the light, and that it was a party, so he gate-crashed. Are you quite sure that the assailant was male? Oh, it must have been. Mrs. Reynolds sounded shocked. I'm sure it was. It couldn't have been a woman, could it? A woman might have been strong enough. Well, I suppose in a way I know what you mean. You mean women are much more athletic nowadays and all that. But they wouldn't do a thing like this, I'm sure. Joyce was only a child, thirteen years old. I don't want to distress you by staying here too long, madame, or ask you difficult questions. That already I am sure the police are doing elsewhere, and I don't want to upset you by dwelling on painful facts. It was just concerning a remark that your daughter made at the party— you were not there yourself, I think. Well, no, I wasn't. I haven't been very well lately, and children's parties can be very tiring. I drove them there, and then later I came back to fetch them. The three children went together, you know. Anne, that's the older one, she is sixteen, and Leopold, who is nearly eleven. What was it Joyce said that you wanted to know about? A Mrs. Oliver, who was there, will tell you what your daughter's words were exactly. She said, I believe, that she had once seen a murder committed. Joyce? 
Oh, she couldn't have said a thing like that. What murder could she possibly have seen committed? Well, uh, everyone seems to think it was rather unlikely, said Poirot. I just wondered if you thought it likely. Did she ever speak to you about such a thing? Seeing a murder? Joyce? You must remember, said Poirot, that the term murder might have been used by someone of Joyce's age in a rather loose way. It might have been just a question of somebody being run over by a car, or of children fighting together, perhaps, and one pushing another into a stream or over a bridge, something that was not meant seriously, but which had an unfortunate result. Well, I can't think of anything like that happening here that Joyce could have seen, and she certainly never said anything about it to me. She must have been joking. She was very positive, said Mrs. Oliver. She kept on saying that it was true and that she'd seen it. Did anyone believe her? asked Mrs. Reynolds. I don't know, said Poirot. I don't think they did, said Mrs. Oliver, or perhaps they didn't want to, uh, well, uh, encourage her by saying they believed it. They were inclined to jeer at her and say she was making it all up, said Poirot less kind-hearted than Mrs. Oliver. Well, that wasn't very nice of them, said Mrs. Reynolds, as though Joyce would tell a lot of lies about things like that. She looked flushed and indignant. I know, it seems unlikely, said Poirot. It was more possible, was it not, that she might have made a mistake, that she might have seen something she did think could have been described as a murder. Some accident, perhaps? She'd have said something about it to me, if so. "'Wouldn't she?' said Mrs. Reynolds, still indignant. "'One would think so,' said Poirot. "'She did not say so at any time in the past. "'You might have forgotten, especially if it wasn't really important.' "'When do you mean?' "'We do not know,' said Poirot. "'That is one of the difficulties. "'It might have been three weeks ago or three years. "'She said she had been quite young at the time.' What does a thirteen-year-old consider quite young? There was no sensational happening round here that you can recall? Oh, I don't think so. I mean, you do hear of things, uh, or read about them in papers. Uh, you know, I mean, women being attacked, or a girl and her young man, or things like that. But nothing important that I can remember, nothing that Joyce took an interest in, or anything of that kind. But if Joyce said positively she saw a murder, would you think she really thought so? She wouldn't say so unless she really did think so, would she? said Mrs. Reynolds. I think she must have got something mixed up, really. Yes, it seems possible. I wonder, he asked, if I might speak to your two children who were also at the party. Well, uh, of course, though I don't know what you can expect them to tell you. Anne's doing her work for her A-levels upstairs, and Leopold's in the garden, assembling a model aeroplane. Leopold was a solid, pudgy-faced boy, entirely absorbed, it seemed, in mechanical construction. It was some few moments before he could pay attention to the questions he was being asked. You were there, weren't you, Leopold? You heard what your sister said? What did she say? Oh, you mean about the murder? He sounded bored. Yes, that's what I mean, said Poirot. She said she saw a murder once. Did she really see such a thing? No, of course she didn't, said Leopold. Who on earth would she see murdered? It was just like Joyce, that. How do you mean it was just like her? Showing off, said Leopold, winding round a piece of wire and breathing forcefully through his nose as he concentrated. She was an awfully stupid sort of girl, he added. She'd say anything. You know, to make people sit up and take notice. So you really think she invented the whole thing? Leopold shifted his gaze to Mrs. Oliver. I expect she wanted to impress you a bit, he said. You write detective stories, don't you? I think she was just putting it on, so that you should take more notice of her than you did of the others. That would also be rather like her, would it? said Poirot. Oh, she'd say anything, said Leopold. I bet nobody believed her, though. 
Were you listening? Do you think anyone believed it? Well, I heard her say it, but I didn't really listen. Beatrice laughed at her, and so did Cathy. They said, that's a tall story, or something. There seemed little more to be got out of Leopold. They went upstairs to where Anne, looking rather more than her sixteen years, was bending over a table with various study books spread round her. Yes, I was at the party, she said. You heard your sister say something about having seen a murder? Oh, yes, I heard her. I didn't take any notice, though. You didn't think it was true? Or of course it wasn't true. There haven't been any murders here for ages. I don't think there's been a proper murder for years. Then why do you think she said so? Oh, she likes showing off. I mean, she used to like showing off. She had a wonderful story once about having travelled to India. My uncle had been on a voyage there, and she pretended she went with him. Lots of girls at school actually believed her. So you don't remember any what you call murders taking place here in the last three or four years? No. Only the usual kind, said Anne. I mean the ones you read every day in the newspaper. And they weren't actually here in Woodley Common. They were mostly in Medchester, I think. Who do you think killed your sister, Anne? You must have known her friends. You would know any people who didn't like her. I can't imagine who'd want to kill her. I suppose someone who was just batty. Nobody else would, would they? There was no one who had uh, quarrelled with her, or who did not get on with her? You mean, did she have an enemy? I think that's silly. People don't have enemies, really. There are just people you don't like. As they departed from the room, Anne said, I don't want to be nasty about Joyce, because she's dead and it wouldn't be kind, but she really was the most awful liar, you know. I mean, I'm sorry to say things about my sister, but it's quite true. Are we making any progress? said Mrs. Oliver as they left the house. None whatever, said Hercule Poirot. That is interesting, he said thoughtfully. Mrs. Oliver looked as though she didn't agree with him. It was six o'clock at Pine Crest. Hercule Poirot put a piece of sausage into his mouth and followed it up with a sip of tea. The tea was strong, and to Poirot singularly unpalatable. The sausage, on the other hand, was delicious, cooked to perfection. He looked with appreciation across the table to where Mrs. Mackay presided over the large brown teapot. Elspeth Mackay was as unlike her brother, Superintendent Spence, as she could be in every way. Where he was broad, she was angular. Her sharp, thin face looked out on the world with shrewd appraisal. She was thin as a thread. Yet there was a certain likeness between them, mainly the eyes and the strongly marked line of the jaw. Either of them, Poirot thought, could be relied upon for judgment and good sense. They would express themselves differently, but that was all. Superintendent Spence would express himself slowly and carefully, as the result of due thought and deliberation. Mrs. Mackay would pounce, quick and sharp, like a cat upon a mouse. "'A lot depends,' said Poirot, "'upon the character of this child, Joyce Reynolds. "'This is what puzzles me most.' "'He looked inquiringly at Spence. "'Oh, you can't go by me,' said Spence. "'I've not lived here long enough. "'Better ask Elspeth.' "'Poirot looked across the table, "'his eyebrows raised inquiringly. "'Mrs. Mackay was sharp as usual in response. "'I'd say she was a proper little liar,' she said. Not a girl whom you'd trust and believe what she said? Elspeth shook her head decidedly. No, indeed. Tell a tall tale she would, and tell it well, mind you. But I'd never believe her. Tell it with the object of showing off? That's right. They told you the Indian story, didn't they? There's many as believed that, you know. Been away for the holidays the family had, gone abroad somewhere. I don't know if it was her father and mother or her uncle and aunt, but they went to India and she came back from those holidays with tall tales of how she'd been taken there with them. Made a good story of it, too, she did. A Maharaja and a tiger shoot and elephants. Ah, it was fine hearing, and a lot of those round here believed it. But I said straight along, she's telling more than ever happened. 
Could be, I thought at first she was just exaggerating, but the story got added to every time. There were more tigers, if you know what I mean, far more tigers than could possibly happen, and elephants too, for that matter. I'd known her before, too, telling tall stories. Always to get attention? Ah, you're right there. She was a great one for getting attention. Because a child told a tall story about a travel trip she never took, said Superintendent Spence, you can't say that every tall tale she told was a lie. It might not be, said Elspeth, but I'd say the likelihood was that it usually would be. So you think that if Joyce Reynolds came out with a tale that she'd seen a murder committed, you'd say she was probably lying and you wouldn't believe the story was true? That's what I think, said Mrs. Mackay. You might be wrong, said her brother. Yes, said Mrs. Mackay. Anyone might be wrong. It's like the old story of the boy who cried wolf, wolf, and he cried it once too often, when it was a real wolf, and nobody had believed him, and so the wolf got him. So you'd sum it up. I'd say the probabilities are that she wasn't speaking the truth, but I'm a fair woman. She may have been. She may have seen something. Not quite so much as she said she saw, but something. And so she got herself killed said Superintendent Spence. You've got to mind that, Elspeth. She got herself killed. That's true enough, said Mrs. Mackay. And that's why I'm saying maybe I misjudged her. And if so, I'm sorry. But ask anyone who knew her, and they'll tell you that lies came natural to her. It was a party she was at, remember, and she was excited. She'd want to make an effect. Indeed, they didn't believe her, said Poirot. Elspeth Mackay shook her head doubtfully. Who could she have seen murdered? asked Poirot. He looked from brother to sister. Nobody, said Mrs. Mackay with decision. There must have been deaths here, say, over the last three years. Oh, that, naturally, said Spence. Just the usual old folks or invalids or what you'd expect, or maybe a hit-and-run motorist. No unusual or unexpected deaths? Well, Elspeth hesitated. I mean, Spence took over, I've jotted a few names down here. He pushed the paper over to Poirot. Save you a bit of trouble, asking questions around. Are these uh, suggested victims? Hardly as much as that. Say, uh, within the range of possibility. Poirot read aloud, Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe, Charlotte Benfield, Janet White, Leslie Ferrier. He broke off looked across the table, and repeated the first name. Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe. Could be, said Mrs. Mackay. Yes. You might have something there, she added a word that sounded like opera. Opera? Poirot looked puzzled. He had heard of no opera. Went off one night, she did, said Elspeth. Was never heard of again. Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe? No, no, the opera girl. She could have put something in the medicine easily enough. And she came into all the money, didn't she? Or so she thought at the time. Poirot looked at Spence for enlightenment. And never been heard of since, said Mrs. Mackay. These foreign girls are all the same. The significance of the word opera came to Poirot. An au pair girl, he said. That's right. Live with the old lady. And a week or two after the old lady died, the au pair girl just disappeared. Went off with some man, I'd say, said Spence. Well... Nobody knew of him, if so, said Elspeth. And there's usually plenty to talk about here. Usually know just who's going with who. Did anybody think there had been anything wrong about Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe's death? asked Poirot. No, she'd got heart trouble. Doctor attended her regularly. But you headed your list of possible victims with her, my friend. Well, she was a rich woman, very rich woman. Her death was not unexpected, but it was sudden. I'd say offhand that Dr. Ferguson was surprised, even if only slightly surprised. I think he expected her to live longer. But doctors do have these surprises. She wasn't one to do as the doctor ordered. She'd been told not to overdo things, but she did exactly as she liked. For one thing, she was a passionate gardener, and that doesn't do art cases any good. Elspeth Mackay took up the tale. She came here when her health failed. 
She was living abroad before. She came here to be near her nephew and niece, Mr. and Mrs. Drake, and she bought the quarry house, a big Victorian house, which included a disused quarry, which attracted her as having possibilities. She spent thousands of pounds on turning that quarry into a sunk garden, or whatever they call the thing. Had a landscape gardener down from Wisley or one of those places to design it. Oh, I can tell you, it's something to look at. I shall go and look at it, said Poirot. Who knows, it might give me ideas. Yes, I would go if I were you. It's worth seeing. And she was rich, you say, said Poirot. Widow of a big shipbuilder. She had packets of money. Her death was not unexpected, because she had a heart condition. But it was sudden, said Spence. No doubts arose that it was due to anything but natural causes. Cardiac failure, or whatever the longer name is that doctors use. Coronary something. No question of an inquest ever arose? Spence shook his head. It has happened before, said Poirot. An elderly woman told to be careful, not to run up and down stairs, not to do any intensive gardening, and so on and so on. But if you get an energetic woman, who's been an enthusiastic gardener all her life, and done as she liked in most ways, then she doesn't always treat these recommendations with due respect. That's true enough. Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe made a wonderful thing of the quarry, or rather, the landscape artist did. Three or four years they worked at it, he and his employer. She'd seen some garden in Ireland, I think it was, when she went on a National Trust tour visiting gardens. With that in mind, they fairly transformed the place. Oh, yes, it has to be seen to be believed. Here is a natural death, then, said Poirot, certified as such by the local doctor. Is that the same doctor who is here now, and whom I am shortly going to see? Dr. Ferguson, yes. He's a man of about sixty. Good at his job, and well liked here. But you suspect that her death might have been murder. For any other reason than those you have already given me? Well, the opera girl, for one thing, said Elspeth. Why? Well, she must have forged the will. Who forged the will if she didn't? You must have more to tell me, said Poirot. What is all of this about a forged will? Well, there was a bit of a fuss when it came to probating, or whatever you call it, the old lady's will. Was it a new will? It was what they call something that sounded like fish, a, a cardi... a, 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 a cody sill? Elspeth looked at Poirot, who nodded. She'd made wills before, said Spence. All much the same. Uh, bequests to charities... Uh, legacies to old servants, but the bulk of her fortune always went to her nephew and his wife, who were her near relatives. And this particular codicil left everything to the opera girl, said Elspeth, because of her devoted care and kindness, something like that. Tell me more about the au pair girl. She came from some country in the middle of Europe, uh, some long name. How long had she been with the old lady? Just over a year. You call her the old lady always. How old was she? Oh, well, in the sixties. Sixty-five or six, say? That is not so very old, said Poirot, feelingly. Made several wills she had, by all accounts, said Elspeth, as Bert's told you. All of them much the same, leaving money to one or two charities, and then perhaps she'd change the charities and some different souvenirs to old servants and all that. But the bulk of the money always went to her nephew and his wife. And I think some other old cousin, who was dead, though, by the time she died, she left the bungalow she'd built to the landscape man for him to live in as long as he liked, and some kind of income for which he was to keep up the quarry garden and let it be walked in by the public, something like that. I suppose the family claimed that the balance of her mind had been disturbed, that there had been undue influence. I think probably it might have come to that, said Spence. But the lawyers, as I say, got on to the forgery sharply. It was not a very convincing forgery, apparently. They spotted it almost at once. Things came to light to show that the opera girl could have done it quite easily, said Elspeth. You see, she wrote a great many of Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe's letters for her, and it seemed Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe had a great dislike of type letters being sent to friends or anything like that. If it wasn't a business letter, she'd always say, Write it in handwriting, and make it as much like mine as you can, and sign it with my name. Mrs. Minden, the cleaning woman, heard her say that one day, 
and I suppose the girl got used to doing it and copying her employer's handwriting, and then it came to her suddenly that she could do this and get away with it, and that's how it all came about. But as I say, the lawyers were too sharp and spotted it. Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe's own lawyers? Yes, Fullerton, Arison and Ledbetter, very respectable firm in Medchester. They'd always done all her legal business for her. Anyway, they got experts onto it, and questions were asked, and the girl was asked questions and got the wind up, just walked out one day, leaving half her things behind her. They were preparing to take proceedings against her, but she didn't wait for that. She just got out. It's not so difficult, really, to get out of this country if you do it in time. Why, you can go on day trips to the continent without a passport, and if you've got a little arrangement with someone on the other side, things can be arranged long before there's any real hue and cry. She's probably gone back to her own country, or changed her name, or gone to friends. But everyone thought that Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe died a natural death? asked Poirot. Yes, I don't think there was ever any question of that. I only say it's possible, because, as I say, these things have happened before where the doctor has no suspicion. Supposing that girl Joyce had heard something, had heard that au pair giving medicines to Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe, and the old lady saying this medicine tastes different to the usual one, or this has got a bitter taste, or it's peculiar. Anyone would think you'd been there listening to things yourself, Elspeth, said Superintendent Spence. This is all your imagination. When did she die? said Poirot. Morning? Evening? Indoors? Out of doors? At home or away from home? Oh, at home. She'd come up from doing things in the garden one day, breathing rather heavily. She said she was very tired, and she went to lie down on her bed, and to put it in one sentence, she never woke up. Which is all very natural, it seems, medically speaking. Poirot took out his little notebook. The page was already headed Victims. Under, he wrote, Number One, Suggested Mrs. Llewellyn Smythe. On the next pages of his book, he wrote down the other names that Spence had given him. He said inquiringly, Charlotte Benfield? Spence replied promptly, Sixteen-year-old shop assistant, multiple head injuries, found on a footpath near the quarry wood. Two young men came under suspicion— both had walked out with her from time to time. No evidence. They assisted the police in their inquiries? asked Poirot. As you say, it's the usual phrase. They didn't assist much. They were frightened, told a few lies, contradicted themselves. They didn't carry conviction as likely murderers, but either of them might have been. What were they like? Peter Gordon, twenty-one, unemployed, had had one or two jobs but never kept them. Lazy, quite good-looking. Had been on probation once or twice for minor pilferings, things of that kind. No record before of violence. Was in with rather a nasty lot of likely young criminals, but usually managed to keep out of serious trouble. And uh, the other one? Thomas Hudd, twenty, stammered, shy, neurotic. Wanted to be a teacher, but couldn't make the grade. Mother a widow, the doting mother type didn't encourage girlfriends. Kept him as close to her apron strings as she could. Had a job in a stationer's. Nothing criminal known against him, but a possibility psychologically, so it seems. The girl played him up a good deal. Jealousy, a possible motive, but no evidence that we could prosecute on. Both of them had alibis. Odds was his mother's. She would have sworn to Kingdom Come that he was indoors with her all that evening and nobody can say he wasn't, or had seen him elsewhere, or in the neighbourhood of the murder. Young Gordon was given an alibi by some of his less reputable friends. Not worth much, but you couldn't disprove it. This happened when? Eighteen months ago. And where? In a footpath in a field not far from Woodley Common. Three quarters of a mile, said Elspeth. Near Joyce's house, the Reynolds house? No, it was on the other side of the village. It seems unlikely to have been the murder Joyce was talking about, said Poirot thoughtfully. If you see a girl being bashed on the head by a young man, you'd be likely to think of murder straight away. Not to wait for a year before you began to think it was murder. Poirot read another name. Leslie Ferrier. Spence spoke again. Lawyer's clerk, uh, twenty-eight, employed by Messrs. Fullerton, Arison, and Ledbetter of Market Street, Medchester. 
Those were Mrs. Llewellyn Smiles' solicitors, I think you said. Yes, yeah, same ones. And what happened to Leslie Ferrier? He was stabbed in the back, not far from the Green Swan pub. He was said to have been having an affair with the wife of the landlord, Harry Griffin. Handsome piece she was. Indeed, still is. Getting perhaps a bit long in the tooth, uh, five or six years older than he was, but she liked them young. The weapon? The knife wasn't found. Les was said to have broken with her and taken up with some other girl, but what girl was never satisfactorily discovered. Ah, and who was suspected in this case? The landlord or the wife? Quite right, said Spence. Might have been either. The wife seemed the more likely. She was half gypsy and a temperamental piece. But there were other possibilities. Our Leslie hadn't led a blameless life. Got into trouble in his early twenties, falsifying his account somewhere, with a spot of forgery. Was said to have come from a broken home and all the rest of it. Employers spoke up for him. He got a short sentence and was taken on by Fullerton Harrison and Ledbetter when he came out of prison. After that he'd gone straight? Well, uh, nothing proved. He appeared to do so, as far as his employers were concerned, but he had been mixed up in a few questionable transactions with his friends. He's what you might call a wrong un, but a careful one. So the alternative was that he might have been stabbed by one of his less reputable associates. When you're in with a nasty crowd, you've got it coming to you with a knife if you let them down. Anything else? Well, he had a good lot of money in his bank account. Paid in in cash, it had been. Nothing to show where it came from. That was suspicious in itself. Possibly pinched from Fullerton, Harrison, and Ledbetter, suggested Poirot. They say not. They had a chartered accountant work on it and look into things. And the police had no idea where else it might have come from. No. Again, said Poirot, not Joyce's murder, I should think. He read the last name. Janet White. Found strangled on a footpath, which was a short cut from the schoolhouse to her home. She shared a flat there with another teacher, Nora Ambrose. According to Nora Ambrose, Janet White had occasionally spoken of being nervous about some man with whom she'd broken off relations a year ago, but who had frequently sent her threatening letters. Nothing was ever found out about this man. Nora Ambrose didn't know his name. Didn't know exactly where he lived. Aha, said Poirot. I like this better. He made a good thick black tick against Janet White's name. For what reason? asked Spence. It is a more likely murder for a girl of Joyce's age to have witnessed. She could have recognized the victim, a schoolteacher whom she knew and who perhaps taught her. Possibly she did not know the attacker. She might have seen a struggle, or heard a quarrel between a girl whom she knew and a strange man, but thought no more of it than that at the time. When was Janet White killed? Two and a half years ago. That again, said Poirot, is about the right time. Both for not realizing that the man she may have seen with his hands round Janet White's neck was not merely necking her, but might have been killing her. But then, as she grew more mature, the proper explanation came to her. He looked at Elspeth. You agree with my reasoning? I see what you mean, said Elspeth. But aren't you going at all this the wrong way round, looking for a victim of a past murder, instead of looking for a man who killed a child here in Woodley Common not more than three days ago? We go from the past to the future, said Poirot. We arrive, shall we say, from two and a half years ago to three days ago. And therefore we have to consider what you, no doubt, have already considered. Who was there, in Woodley Common, amongst the people who were at the party, who might have been connected with an older crime? Oh, one can narrow it down a bit more than that now, said Spence. That is, if we are right in accepting your assumption that Joyce was killed because of what she claimed earlier in the day about seeing murder committed. She said those words during the time the preparations for the party were going on. Mind you, we may be wrong in believing that that was the motive for the killing but I don't think we are wrong. So, let us say she claimed to have seen a murder, and someone who was present during the preparations for the party that afternoon could have heard her and acted as soon as possible. Who was present? said Poirot. You know, I presume. Yes, 
I have the list for you here. You have checked it carefully? Yes, I've checked and rechecked. It's been quite a job. Here are the eighteen names. List of people present during the preparation for Halloween party. Mrs. Drake, owner of house. Mrs. Butler. Mrs. Oliver. Miss Whittaker, schoolteacher. Reverend Charles Cottrell, vicar. Simon Lampton, curate. Miss Lee, Dr. Ferguson's dispenser. Anne Reynolds, Joyce Reynolds, Leopold Reynolds. Nicholas Ransom, Desmond Holland, Beatrice Ardley, Kathy Grant, Diana Brent, Mrs. Garlton, household help, Mrs. Minden, cleaning woman, Mrs. Goodbody, helper. You are sure these are all? No, said Spence. I'm not sure. I can't really be sure. Nobody can. You see, odd people brought things. Somebody brought some colored light bulbs. Someone else supplied some mirrors. There were some extra plates. Someone lent a plastic pail. People brought things, exchanged a word or two, went away again. They didn't remain to help. Therefore, such a person could have been overlooked and not remembered as being present. But that somebody, even if they'd only just deposited a bucket in the hall, could have overheard what Joyce was saying in the sitting room. She was shouting, you know. We can't really limit it to this list, but it's the best we can do. Here you are. Take a look at it. I've made a brief descriptive note against the names. I thank you. Just one question. You must have interrogated some of these people, those, for instance, who were also at the party. Did anyone, anyone at all, mention what Joyce had said about seeing a murder? I think not. There is no record of it officially. The first I heard of it is what you told me. Interesting, said Poirot. One might also say remarkable. Well, obviously no one took it seriously, said Spence. Poirot nodded thoughtfully. I must go now to keep my appointment with Dr. Ferguson after his surgery, he said. He folded up Spence's list and put it in his pocket. Dr. Ferguson was a man of sixty, of Scottish extraction, with a brusque manner. He looked Poirot up and down with shrewd eyes under bristling eyebrows and said, Well, uh, what's all this about? Sit down. Uh, I mind that chair leg. The caster's loose. I should perhaps explain, said Dr. Ferguson. Everybody knows everything in a place like this. That authoress woman brought you down here as God's greatest detective to puzzle police officers. <laughs> That's more or less right, isn't it? In part, said Poirot. I came here to visit an old friend, ex-Superintendent Spence, who lives with his sister here. Spence? Ah, yeah, good type. Bulldog breed, good honest police officer of the old type. No graft, no violence. Not stupid, either. Straight as a die. You appraise him correctly. Well, said Ferguson, what did you tell him, and what did he tell you? Both he and Inspector Raglan have been exceedingly kind to me. I hope you will be likewise. I've nothing to be kind about, said Ferguson. I don't know what happened. A child gets her head shoved in a bucket and is drowned in the middle of a party. Nasty business. Mind you, doing in a child isn't anything to be startled about nowadays. I've been called out to look at too many murdered children in the last seven to ten years. Far too many. A lot of people who ought to be under mental restraint aren't under mental restraint— no room in the asylums. They go about, nicely spoken, nicely got up, and looking like everybody else, looking for somebody they can do in and enjoy themselves. Don't usually do it at a party, though. Too much chance of getting caught, I suppose. But novelty appeals even to a mentally disturbed killer. Have you any idea who killed her? Do you really suppose that's a question I can answer just like that? <laughs> I'd have to have some evidence, wouldn't I? I'd have to be sure. You could guess, said Poirot. Anyone can guess. If I'm called into a case, I have to guess whether the chap's going to have measles, or whether it's a case of an allergy to shellfish or to feather pillows. I have to ask questions to find out what they've been eating or drinking or sleeping on, or what other children they've been meeting. 
Whether they've been in a crowded bus with Mrs. Smith's or Mrs. Robinson's children, who've all got the measles, and a few other things, then I advance a tentative opinion as to which it is of the various possibilities, and that, let me tell you, is what's called diagnosis. You don't do it in a hurry, and you make sure. Did you know this child? Well, of course. She was one of my patients. There are two of us here, myself and Worrell. I happen to be the Reynolds doctor. She was quite a healthy child, Joyce. Had the usual small childish ailments. Nothing peculiar or out of the way. Ate too much. Talked too much. Talking too much hadn't done her any harm. Eating too much gave her what used to be called in the old days a bilious attack from time to time. Uh, she'd had mumps and chicken pox, uh, nothing else. But she had perhaps talked too much on one occasion, as you suggest she might be able to do. Oh, so that's the tack you're on. I heard some rumour of that, on the lines of uh, what the butler saw. Only tragedy instead of comedy, is that it? It could form a motive, a reason. Oh, yes, grant you that. But there are other reasons. Mentally disturbed seems the usual answer nowadays. At any rate, it does always in the magistrate's courts. Nobody gained by her death, nobody hated her, but it seems to me with children nowadays you don't need to look for a reason. The reason's in another place. The reason's in the killer's mind. His disturbed mind, or his evil mind, or his kinky mind. Any kind of mind you like to call it. I'm not a psychiatrist. There are times when I get tired of hearing those words remanded for a psychiatrist's report. After a lad has broken in somewhere, smashed the looking glasses, pinched the bottles of whiskey, stolen the silver, knocked an old woman on the head, doesn't matter much what it is now. Remand them for a psychiatrist's report. And who would you favor in this case to remand for the psychiatrist's report? Oh, you mean, of those there at the do the other night? Yes. Well, the murderer would have had to be there, wouldn't he? Otherwise there wouldn't have been a murder, right? He was among the guests. He was among the helpers. Or he walked in through the window with malice aforethought. Probably he knew the fastenings of that house. Might have been in there before, looking round. Take your man or boy. He wants to kill someone. Not at all unusual. Over in Medchester we had a case of that. Came to light after about six or seven years. Boy of thirteen. Wanted to kill someone. So he killed a child of nine, pinched a car, drove it seven or eight miles into a copse, burned her there, went away, and as far as we know, led a blameless life until he was twenty-one or two. Mind you, we have only his word for that. He may have gone on doing it. Probably did. Found he liked killing people. Don't suppose he's killed too many, or some police force would have been on to him before now. But every now and then he felt the urge. Psychiatrist's report? Committed murder while mentally disturbed. I'm trying to say myself that that's what's happened here. That sort of thing, anyway. I'm not a psychiatrist myself, thank goodness. I have a few psychiatrist friends. Some of them are sensible chaps. Some of them, well, I'll go as far as saying they ought to be remanded for a psychiatrist report themselves. This chap who killed Joyce probably had nice parents, ordinary manners, good appearance. Nobody'd dream anything was wrong with him. Ever had a bite at a nice red juicy apple, and there, down by the core, something rather nasty rears itself up and wags its head at you? Plenty of human beings about like that. More than there used to be, I'd say, nowadays. And you've no suspicion of your own. I can't stick my neck out and diagnose a murderer without some evidence. Still, you admit it must have been someone at the party. You cannot have a murder without a murderer. You can easily in some detective stories that are written. Probably your pet authoress writes them like that. But in this case I agree. The murderer must have been there. A guest, a domestic help, someone who walked in through the window. Easily done if he'd studied the catch of the window beforehand. It might have struck some crazy brain that it would be a novel idea and a bit of fun to have a murder at a Halloween party. That's all you've got to start off with, isn't it? Just someone who was at the party. Under bushy brows, a pair of eyes twinkled at Poirot. I was there myself, he said. Came in late, just to see what was doing. 
He nodded his head vigorously. Yes, that's the problem, isn't it? Like a social announcement in the papers, amongst those present was a murderer. End of Disc 2